Right, that's everybody in now, so I think we can start. You're muted, Janet. I know I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. We starting just a, a few moments late, but it's still an absolutely wonderful uh, facility, isn't it, to have this time together in the uh, in this gallery that we recognize and greet one another. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and wherever you are, welcome. Um, here we are moving into autumn, and so we have the autumn colors, which are absolutely beautiful. One of the things about being in the UK is that we do have seasons. Um, most of the seasons have a lot of rain, it has to be said. <laughs> but uh, anyway, here we are. Here we are. And I'd like to hand over to uh, Roland and Brenda, who will lead us in our prayer time. Now, um, Brenda, you're muted. And Mary, I'm not sure whether you can unmute. I can't, uh, I've asked her to unmute. Yes, and here she is. Well done. So if I can ask Roland and Brenda to lead us into our meditation time. Thank you. Oh God, come to our assistance. Lord, make haste to help. Oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Laudato Si. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness, evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. She groans in travail. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters.
Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the silent presence of the Spirit of your Son. Lead us into that mysterious silence where your love is revealed to all who call. Ma Ra Na Tha. Come, Lord Jesus.
Well, this is a, always a very pleasant role to fulfill, to, to welcome our speaker, but also to thank uh, Brenda from the UK and Roland from Australia, who led us into our meditation. You may have noticed that uh, the reading was from Laudate, um, as was the quote in JM's email. Um, some of you might have noticed that the the um, reading in the attachment was from John Main, but actually it was from Ladate and a beautiful reading. So thank you. Thank you, Roland, for reading that. And very appropriate. Let us drink of the wisdom of St. Benedict and together be the well of love the world can drink from. The quote to bring us into listening to the words of Voltaire Alferez from the Philippines, who is going to share with us his own concerns and his experience as the, I love the phrase, the chief igniter of ignited minds. That's a beautiful title to hold, role to hold. A consultancy on the leadership and management, but 15 years in advocacy and development and with a real focus on the environmental protection of the world. So Voltaire, a joy to welcome you and we all sit now uh, to listen to your words to share in our understanding. Thank you very much, Janet, for, for that introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who are uh, who is joining this evening's or this uh, activity. And um, I'd like to express my sincerest gratitude to the community for inviting me over um, to share with you some thoughts no? on the current issues revolving uh, environment and climate change most especially. And it's so important because now the world is gathered in Glasgow in Scotland for the conference of the parties, the 26th conference of the parties, negotiating, discussing, and hopefully coming up with a concrete plan on how to address the rising temperature until the 2050 uh, period. Um, just as, as addition, an addition to my background, I'm, I used to study for the priesthood um, under the order of Augustinian Recollects. So I learned my meditative practice there and my advocacy actually stemmed from that spirituality, no? the spirituality of uh, creation. And um, when I came out, that is where I was led into um, to work for environment protection, especially in my country, the Philippines. The topic I was given, or at least I was allowed to share with you, is environmental citizenship in the spirit of Laudato Si. This topic, I've been giving this for quite some time now, but it is enriched primarily because of the encyclical letter of the Holy Father, Laudato Si. It joins no, the pantheon of social doctrines within the church, starting with the Rerum Novarum of Leo XIII, where um, uh, the value of labor and the rights of laborers were extolled by the late pontiff, down to uh, Pacementeris, Humane Vitae, uh, Gaudium et Spes, and then of course we have Laudato Si, which is the first encyclical the first social teaching uh, elucidated by a pontiff dedicated to the environment. And it's very important because this is indeed uh, the turning point no, of the world. Uh, 
So I'd like to approach the talk from both a scientific but also a spiritual and perhaps a theological re reflection on the topic of environmentalism or at least as I call it, environmental citizenship. So this is the planet. We've seen this picture. This is a famous picture all over the world taken uh, uh, during one of NASA's flights no, into space. Um, it is clear blue with patches of green. And this is uh, the only planet known to humanity to contain the perfect combination of elements, compounds, and whatnot to support life as we know it. It is the only planet that we know as of the moment with current technologies to support life, a perfect combination of um, elements and compounds. It is shared as a home by millions of species. And that is why Pope Francis in his encyclical calls it a common home, because we share that with millions of species, some microscopic, some larger than us, um, but still call this place a home. If we come to think of it from, from a very biological and perhaps physical perspective, every single species on the planet has a place, has a reason for being. Um, without the land, of course, this would be completely a water planet. Without water, this would be a parched earth. Without um, animals, microorganisms, bacteria, even viruses, a lot of the processes of life will not occur. Um, I was just reminded uh, the other day when we were talking about lactobacilli strain, because no? we, were, we were trying to look for ways to boost our immune system because of this pandemic. And uh, lactobacilli is a bacteria that's good for the stomach. And I realized that you know this bacteria that is present in our stomach is critical for digestion. Without which, if we eat it, if we eat the banana, we will release also a banana. No? It will not be decomposed. It will not be used by the body. The nutrients will not be absorbed by the body. And it's all because of this important bacteria in our gut. The same is true with plants. No? Without plants, of course, uh, the earth will most likely be a poisoned earth, no? a poisoned planet because of methane, carbon dioxide, and many other greenhouse gases that is being regulated and balanced because of the existence of plants from the algae to the big forests around the world no? that are being threatened as well as of this moment. And then we come to the species called the human species. Back then, I had a rector in the seminary who led us into a subject called the philosophy of man or rational psychology. And the reflection revolved around Bernard Lonergan's dissertation on why is man or why, why are humans existent on this planet? And a point that stark until this very moment occurred to me that even if humans do not exist on this planet, if all the other elements are present, this planet will continue to survive as it is. Because there is nothing that us humans contribute that is so necessary that without us, the planet's system will collapse. I'll repeat that. If you take away plants, the earth will not survive. If we take away organisms, bacteria, other forms, the planet will not survive. But if we take away humans from the equation, 
the earth will survive. And that is essentially what other islands, outlying islands are experiencing. No? Islands that are uninhabited. No humans ever stepped on them. They remain paradise. Well, at least for those that are there, no? the species that are there. So in that reflection that we did back in the seminary, we realized that from a physical, biological perspective, we need, humans need the earth more than the earth needs humans. I'll repeat that. Humans need the earth more than the humans uh, more than the earth needs humans. And that is precisely the opening paragraphs of Log Laudato Si. Pope Francis beautifully paints a picture of how the Genesis story, the creation story, prepared the existence, the survival of humans. The five days of creation were all about preparing this planet, this home, so that humans survive. God could have stopped on the, sixth, on the fifth day and just skipped the sixth day and started to rest already. No. He, he moved to the sixth day and created beings according to his image and likeness. Beings that are entirely dependent on the previous creations of God from the first to the fourth day, to the fifth day, sorry. We need the earth more than the earth needs us. And that is the spirituality that Pope Francis, and coming from a greater spirituality of St. Francis of Assisi, wants the world to once again rediscover. This is not something that we do not know. We have known this. St. Francis has elucidated this. The early church fathers have spoken about this. But we need to rediscover it because in the myriad, in the process of development, we have lost it. Our civilizations have grown because of the of the conquer of nature and it is usually in hierarchical worldview humans on the top animals next and plants in the bottom and this is coming from a distorted understanding of dominion in the genesis story and pope francis wonderfully discusses that in in Laudato Si, we have distorted the idea, the concept, the understanding of dominion. Dominion has become lording it over, harnessing, abusing, even exploiting the world that was prepared by the creator for humans to survive. Mm. The, therefore, as the centuries developed, the prevailing mindset became command and conquer, and the economic model has become extraction and consumption. Wars no, have been waged because of that prevailing mindset. No? Um, from the great wars of the Middle Ages to the more recent wars in the 20th century, it has always been to command and to conquer natural resources. Now, there is a race towards Mars. <laughs> we want to, be dom to have dominion once more of the space outside the planet to another planet. But that is the prevailing mindset. Are we saying that is, that is in, intrinsically evil? No, that even Pope Francis says it's intrinsically evil. But the excesses and the abuses of this mindset, of this economic model, is what is problematic. The Industrial Revolution was perfect for our age. It was necessary to, to prepare humanity 
for a better life, to give humanity the comforts that we are experiencing right now. But it came with a cost. Why? Because instead of stopping where we all need, we went even further and created the excesses that the world is experiencing. And that has led to a dangerous experiment. And now I'm transitioning a little bit to climate change, especially because uh, in Glasgow right now, the governments and civil society are discussing about what we can do to avert climate crisis. Through the ice cores that scientists have, have dug up in the, in the North and the South Poles, they have found out levels of CO2 presence in the atmosphere, even as far back as 400,000 years ago. And they have seen that it always goes up and goes down. There is a warming period, and that warming period is usually followed by an ice age. It has been a cycle. So it's not as if climate change is not natural. It is natural because it has been a cycle and they have seen that through this data that they've collected through the ice cores. It goes, the temperature goes up, there's global warming therefore, and then there's ice age, the climate change. So it, it goes, in, goes up and goes down as you can see in the graph. However, beginning 1950s, scientists have realized that the deposit of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is steadily growing higher than the previous highs of the different ice ages. That started the call to examine it more. So at the beginning, my dear friends, there was no political maneuvering whatsoever. No, it was just the scientists telling governments, something is happening here and we are seeing something. So there was no political maneuvering there. It was just a call, you know, a red flag. But because it was given to the politicians and politicians are normally driven by their own lobbies. So the lobbies created the, the different scenarios and therefore we are here right now. But nevertheless, let us see, look at the facts. Since 1950s, carbon dioxide emissions and deposits on the atmosphere are stood, uh, steadily growing higher. In 2019, we have already, according to the NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric uh, Authority of the US, we have already reached or we have already crossed 400 parts per million in terms of carbon dioxide. And according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the correlation between the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is clear with the rise of temperature. Now, if you can see here, the global temperature is in the middle, is also rising as well as the presence of carbon dioxide by the year 2000 and methane. Now we are even at a higher level. And since the turn of the century, we have already increased 0.86 degrees Celsius. If we are still gonna be doing business as usual, meaning you know one ton fossil fuel burning, uh, deforestation, we could well be on the road towards four, even five degrees hotter in the next century. And that is why in the climate change work, the call is to work hard to ensure that we don't go beyond two degrees because two degrees, according to scientists, already has cataclysmic effects on many communities. There will be increased intensity of tropical cyclone activity 
and that we have already experienced here in the Philippines, where we receive 20 on average, 15 to 20 typhoons a year. Now, Germany, several in Europe have already experienced these kinds of phenomena. Hotter days and nights and more intense, longer droughts, according to the IPCC, the group of scientists you know, recording and studying all of this. And there's also a glacial evidence of the warming of the world. Glaciers are important because they control the movement of cold and hot air and water in the world, as well as source of fresh water in many countries. This is in Montana. This is from the Discovery Channel, by the way. This was taken in 1913, and this is in 2005. The thing is, before, when glaciers melt during summer, they melt and provide water to the communities. But in winter, they almost go back to their same size, the same thickness, same volume. However, in the last few decades, scientists have seen that they do not go back anymore to their same thickness volume as before. This is a Boulder Glacier in Montana as well. These are humans, by the way. And that is that now in 1988. The Muir Glacier in um, Alaska. And it has receded already to as far back as that area. And now we have a lake you know, there in its place. And this is happening not just in North America. It's happening in Bolivia, in India, in Tibet, in Bhutan. And the tundra that is... Uh, existent in many of the Arctic countries have started to thaw as well, leading to further destruction in the communities and the houses, buildings that are built on tundra. Still, we have seen latest phenomenon impacted by climate change, um, one of which is sea level rise. Now, according to a new study, about 200 million people will be displaced by 2100 due to sea level rise. And many of our friends, because I'm also part of an Asia Pacific consortium, many of our friends in the Pacific uh, Islands, Tuvalu, um, Nauru, um, Tahiti, and most especially the island of Kiribati, they have already experienced seawater entering their communities. Even in the Philippines, we have uh, communities, villages already that uh, the coastline have already moved inward to the communities. So you could imagine the impact of this in many, many countries, primarily because as salt water comes in, it goes into the water table and affects drinking water to many communities. So not just their livelihood will be affected, they will also be affected, their health will also be affected. Another is wildfires. No? Um, we've seen the latest wildfires in North America, uh, in Seattle and in Canada, and then previously in Australia. No? And how can wildfires be caused or impacted by climate change? Well, According to a study by the Department of Agriculture in the US, climate change exacerbates the factors that create the perfect fire conditions, lower precipitation, warmer air temperatures, dry the forests and other vegetation. And a little spark, a small spark can ignite the whole thing. So this is something that has happened and will definitely continue to happen. Of course, extreme weather events, huh? unpredictable extreme weather. Uh, the Philippines uh, experienced this uh, a few years ago with Typhoon Haiyan. Um, over a few months ago, Germany, for the first time in recent history, 
experienced massive floods. Um, China also, India, and the US as well. And the intensity of these typhoons, of these extreme weather events will continue to rise. And that is, my dear friends, why Pope Francis perhaps felt it is, there is a need to reclaim that lost identity, that lost citizenship. Because as I have said in the beginning, we have come to develop a sense of dominion, that we are the Lord of this earth, that we are uh, masters of the elements. Pope Francis very eloquently put that into perspective when he said, it is because of sin, our brokenness, that separated us from the creator and the rest of the created realm. He said, this in turn distorted our mandate to have dominion over the earth, to till it and to keep it. And as a result, the originally harmonious relationship between human beings and nature became conflictual. Remember in the narrative of Adam and Eve, they lived harmoniously in the Garden of Eden. But because of sin, it became conflictual. So allow me to share with you a video just to you know, highlight what would happen if we continue along this path of exploitation and degradation, even to the point of human extinction. So this is a scenario of what if all humans suddenly disappeared from the earth. You are one of 7.6 billion people on this earth. But what does that mean? How can those 10 digits properly reflect the size of our species? Can we truly grasp our impact on this planet? Currently, to better understand our presence on Earth, we consider a variety of statistics, like how many cars are on the road at once, or how many emails are sent per day. But maybe it would tell us more to take all that away. This is what if, and here's what would happen if all humans suddenly disappeared from the Earth. The second humans disappear from Earth, Chaos ensues. Planes, trains, and automobiles without drivers would collide, derail, and tumble out of the sky. Within the first hour, mass blackouts would start to occur across the globe. Electricity generated from coal plants would fail once their fuel ran out, while wind and water powered systems would also shut down without human supervision. The next day, computers would act on their own accord to shut down nuclear reactors in order to prevent disaster. The world would be completely without power, but nuclear crises would at least be temporarily averted. On day three, London's Big Ben rings for the last time, since it needs to be wound every three days. Big Ben would sound over streets now populated with roaming animals. Thousands of pets and zoo creatures would have to break free or suffer starvation. Within 10 days, security measures in nuclear power plants would finally fail, setting off a chain of explosions and releasing toxic radiation across the globe. Wildlife in affected regions would die, but elsewhere, other species would prevail. Domesticated cattle and livestock would take to the North American Great Plains where they could graze freely. Supermarkets would be infested with mice and rats, and former pets would turn feral in their bid for survival. Within a few years, the cities we so easily recognize today would look like converted natural theme parks. Nuclear radiation would have cleared and vegetation would sprout across the urban sprawl. Moss would overtake the streets while trees and flowers would travel up and along abandoned towers. After 30 years, the satellites we set up to explore would fall back down to earth with no one to collect their data. Homes and skyscrapers will have rotted or collapsed. In some coastal areas, entire cities will have been reclaimed by the sea and old ships sunk or ran aground would be the foundation of new coral reefs. Despite our absence, global warming would continue for another 40 years after we're gone. The Earth's temperature would rise about another 0.6 degrees. 
but the environment would nonetheless be improving drastically. By year 60, marine life would have nearly recovered from decades of overfishing and would be thriving. In 150 years, urban environments would be restored to their natural status before human time. London would revert to swampland, and in northern cities like Vancouver, skeletons of buildings would poke out from layer upon layer of snow and ice. Las Vegas might look like a giant sandcastle. In 230 years, vegetation that has thrived in humans' absence will have eliminated excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Huge forests will have reclaimed the eastern half of North America, and the only evidence we ever existed would be leftover steel and plastics. Once glorious landmarks would slowly succumb to decay. 500 years after humans disappeared, the world's forests would be the healthiest that they've been in 10,000 years. The natural world would have succeeded in erasing most of the final traces of human existence. Of course, even after 25,000 years, some of our plastic objects might still be found, along with everything we've left on past trips to the moon. So if you've ever wondered what it means to be one of the 7.6 billion people on this earth, then think of it this way. It would take more than 25,000 years to hide the fact that we were ever here. Our domination of the land is huge and incredible. And while humans might not disappear into thin air, we can take our planet for granted. How will you help to make our world a better place? And that is why there is a need for a conversion. And that is what Pope Francis has called a conversion of the heart to reclaim the lost identity of being who we are truly within the context of creation. Even Pope, uh, the Benedict, uh, Saint Benedict of Nursia, no? in his uh, way of life, and the, Pope Francis uh, quoted this because there was such a great deal of insistence to dominate the land and in countries and kingdoms. Pope Benedict and his monks retreated from the world no? and became. Uh, dependent on the land, respected the land. That's why they grow their own food and they surrounded themselves with nature. So is this really the future we want? Of course not. Uh, there are many ways to, to do that. No? One is, of course, um, to ensure that our lifestyle uh, does not in any way contribute more than it needs to, to the destruction of the earth. Many have gone vegetarian or even vegan, or even just saying less meat can do, can be a big help. Another is of course on energy efficiency, when we also ensure that our energy use and consumption is efficient enough by employing technologies, even solar power or wind can go a long way. More importantly, because we are all consumers and we are all citizens of our respective countries, we must demand from our businesses that provide goods to us, from our leaders in government to ensure that sustainability is key in their production or in their development mechanisms. This can never be a, an isolated solution anymore. This is already a global problem. And that's why it, is, it needs to have a global solution. And that is why the leaders are in Glasgow, right? But even in our own little way, we can still do something. If at all, you cannot do anything because there's already you know, pro, uh, certain um, aspects in your lifestyle that, that necessitates the use of, of, uh, of high energy or even plastic or whatnot, then at least plant a tree or support organizations that plant trees because trees, after all, are very important in the fight against climate change. At the end, this is personal to me because I, I'm now a father. When I started this, I was a young graduate from the seminary. Now I am a father. 
And the future that I want to live this boy is a future that is safe and secure where he can thrive with all of God's creation. As Pope Francis has said, when we can see God reflected in all that exists, our hearts are moved to praise the Lord for all his creatures and to worship him in union with them. So thank you very much. And I hope that somehow you join in that march towards reclaiming our environmental citizenship. Thank you. Well, Voltaire, you might like to know that I'm not the only one, I'm sure, who has written many notes um, taken from your talk. It's beautiful, beautiful, truthful, and what, and hopeful in a strange way, um, because what you, you gave us was, you know, humans need earth more than earth needs humans. And that's something we really need to take away from today. So thank you so much. It's been a joy to hear you and to see your son. Um, so if I can ask Brenda and Roland to, uh, to lead us in our closing prayer. Thank you. May the divine assistance remain always with us. You're muted, um, Brenda. And with our absent brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you to both of you and to Voltaire, and I'll hand back to Mary um, to, uh, to end our time together. It just remains for me to say thank you to Janet for being our welcomer today, uh, to Voltaire for his powerful talk, and to Roland and Brenda for leading us in prayer, and I look forward to uh, meeting up with you again next week. Hi everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Valjo. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank you also. It was beautiful, Voltaire. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you also. so much for the talk. Amazing thank talk. You. Thank you. Thank you, Voltaire. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Voltaire. Thank you, Voltaire. Thank you for, thank you for listening. Love to everyone. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, JM. Bye-bye. Thank you, JM. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda and Roland. Thank you, Thank you, JM. Thank you.